<laughs> Seems like it, huh? <laughs> I think it's that and something else. <clears throat> I think that's it. <clears throat> So as already pointed out, we have a little bit more intimate class today. Seems some people started spring recess a little bit early, but they're lost, right? Okay. So um, let's carry on with uh, lecture. Four. We will carry on in a moment with lecture 14, where we were talking about the neat and hyper neat uh, pair of algorithms. And just to take a step back from that, we're working our way through this third theme on the open challenges uh, in the field. Again, this is a young field, a lot of questions out there that don't have a good answer to them. So what we're doing in this theme is introducing some problems or some challenges and then solutions that have been proposed in the literature uh, so far and playing the pros and cons game. What are some of the advantages or good ideas and some of the solutions to the problems, but what are those solutions still missing so that they don't address the problem uh, completely. Okay, so we'll get back to that uh, in a moment. Uh, assignment 9 for the undergraduates is due not this coming Tuesday, but the Tuesday af uh, after. So trying to give you a little bit of breathing room over the spring recess so we can rest and recuperate for the final push after spring recess. Okay, any questions about assignments, final projects? Um, grad students, I will have a look at some of the final projects, ideas that you have submitted. I'm also running behind. I'll get caught up over the spring break for me. Okay. So, um, again, open challenges in the field. Uh, we looked in lecture uh, 13 at modularity. So the problem there is that when evolution is left to its own devices, or at least artificial evolution, it often finds non-modular non solutions which tend to be these sort of hills in the mountain ranges of fitness landscapes. They're local optima. They can optimize a neural network in which every neuron is connected to every other neuron. It's non-modular, but then it's difficult for evolution to make progress from there. Why? Why is it hard to evolve non-modular systems? You don't know what the modules are, but that's already assuming that we're going to try and modularize the, the system. Even before that happens, we have a non-modular system. Evolution has a non-modular neural network. Every neuron is connected to every other one. Then you affect one snatch of one neuron and completely alter the entire path of the neural network. Absolutely. So we've got a fully connected neural network. A mutation hits this synapse and changes the weight of this synapse. Um, that influences the flow of sensory information that comes through that synapse to the motors. The robot moves because it's interacting with the environment, because it's an embodied agent. When it pushes against the world, it observes how the world pushes back. Sensor, then motors move, and then the values arriving at all the sensors tend to be different, which means all the incoming values at the next time step are all different and the system breaks down, right? So whether we're talking about an evolved system or a human-made system, when you have something that's non-modular, it gets very hard to make improvements to it. Those of you that have done any coding and have developed any code of sufficient size, if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, it becomes less and less modular and it gets harder and harder to extend and improve your code, right? Same thing for evolution. So that's the challenge. How do we allow evolution to continue to make progress? We want to either impose some modularity on the system or let evolution figure out what the modules are, what those modules to do, should do, and when do those modules uh, take effect. That's what we looked at in lecture 13. Lecture 14, we introduced the neat and hyper neat pair of algorithms. What was the challenge that those two solutions, those two algorithms were designed 
to overcome. Not modularity anymore. No? Yes? The one part of the NEAT acronym was like indicating biological reproduction where you only want to get one copy of the gene from two parents. That's it. So you're describing the NEAT algorithm, which, like sexual recombination, lines up two genotypes, which in our case are two neural networks, tries to find similar pairs of elements in those two networks, and copies into the child one element from each of those pairs. That's the solution, but what was the challenge to begin with? Why bother with the NEAT algorithm? Why not just evolve neural networks, mutate them, cross them? Why bother? Um, to try to evolve topologies and to try to allow crossover in networks because if, if, if you because if you cross over networks without using NEAT you end up missing information like uh, that ABC CBA example that they had in the paper. That's it. So the pro the challenge that it was designed to address is the competing conventions problem, right? We have two neural networks which have started to evolve to solve three sub-problems and assume all these three sub-problems are necessary for the overall, uh, to solve the overall problem, but they might be in different places, right? Gene A and parent one may be in the left part of the network and gene A, corresponding gene A in the other parent is at a different part of the network. So NEAT is trying to find these common circuits or these common pieces line them up and then cross them over accordingly. And one of the nice things about NEAT is it not only allows that to happen, but often produces a child network that has different topology than either children, right? Topology is the number and wiring up of uh, the neurons. This is a tricky thing to do. Most of what you've seen up to this date, we fix the topology and then evolution just evolves the synaptic weights, right? The strengths of the connections. So that's the NEAT algorithm. We ended last time by introducing HyperNeat, which uh, sits on top of NEAT. So NEAT is the underlying engine, and NEAT is going to be evolving populations of neural networks uh, as it does. But these neural networks are special. They're known as, they're known as these compositional pattern-producing networks, or CPPNs. So you've seen CTRNNs before, which are this continuous time neural networks. CPPNs have this nice property that they have different functions inside the neurons. And in essence, what you're doing is composing functions. That's the compositional part. The other innovation of CPPNs is that they take as input some coordinate system. And in the cartoon example here, they use a coordinate system from a two-dimensional plane. You pass coordinates as at the input layer, and at the output layer arrives a value that paints something at that position in that space, right? So in the cartoon example here, we're painting color uh, onto uh, <coughs> pixels. And last time, I think I introduced this neural network to you. So now we, we're back to a neural network that's gonna control a robot. We've got the hidden layer in the left sheet here, or sorry, the sensor layer in the left sheet here, hidden layer in the center, output layer in the back, so we have neurons now which are embedded in a three-dimensional space. In the sensor layer here, we have 12 proprioceptive sensors, which report the current angle of the hip front and back, hip in and out, and the knee of the four legs. So 12 proprioceptive sensors, four touch sensors, and three additional orientation sensors that detect yaw, pitch, and roll. And finally, a sinusoidal output, so there's our CPG. So we've got a total of 5 times 4, or 20 sensors. Each of those 20 sensors is wired up by a synapse, synapses which are not shown in this figure, to the neurons in the hidden layer, from the hidden layer onto the output layer. So now we have, back to a neural network that's controlling a robot, and we're going to paint, not color onto pixels, but weights onto synapses. So far so good? Okay. So um, what we're going to do here is we're going to take the x, y, and z coordinate, remember the neurons are in a three-dimensional space here, 
We're going to take the coordinate of the pre, for every synapse, we're going to take the x, y, and z coordinate of the presynaptic neuron, the one at the base of the synapse, and also the x, y, and z coordinate of the postsynaptic neuron, the neuron that's at the head of the arrow where the synapse arises. And we're going to feed those six numbers into our CPPN, and our CPPN is going to have one output neuron, which is the weight of that synapse. Okay, you should be confused at this point. This seems kind of strange, right? We have the NEAT algorithm, which evolves populations of neural networks. We have HyperNeat, which is evolving populations of CPPNs. We're going to take a given CPPN and paint weights onto a second neural network. This seems like overkill, right? Why bother doing this? If we want to evolve neural networks to control a four-legged robot, why don't we do what we've always done? Just evolve, take all of these synapses, put them into a big matrix of synaptic weights, and evolve that matrix of synaptic weights. Because the pattern, because the movement of legs follows a pattern, and if you use a pattern generating network, you may be able to output a pattern of weights that's going to correspond to a particular motion. You're going to output a pattern of weights. So instead of just having a random collection of weights, we're going to have some sort of pattern, and who knows what that pattern might be. So again, if you use this cartoon here and forget about the insect, just the colors, you get regular, when you take a CPPN, even if you create a random CPPN, it tends to produce uh, coordinated patterns over the space. You remember at the Blackboard last week, we did a simple CPPN. It was simple, but it was still random. We created uh, one hidden node and we connected the X node to the hidden node and it produced this horizontal gradient. Then we mutated that CPPN, and then it produced a vertical gradient. Then we mutated it again, and it produced a diagonal gradient. So we have random CPPNs, but they tend to paint regular patterns onto whatever we want them to paint patterns onto. Right? So we're kind of changing the fitness landscape for in HyperNeat, where we're going to bias search towards things that have regular patterns in them. And especially when we're talking about walking robots, we want them to have a regular pattern, right? Remember our discussion about legged locomotion? We don't want silly walks. First of all, silly walks are silly, but they're also very energy inefficient, right? Most legged animals on this planet walk with a regular gait because it's very energy efficient. It also is pretty robust. It allows you to recover from perturbations and so on. Okay, so that's why we're going to this extra effort of evolving neural networks, CPPNs, taking each CPPN and it paints a second neural network and then that neural network is going to control the robot. So that's a hypothesis. Does reg do re do regular patterns of synaptic weights tend to produce regular oscillatory gates? And we'll see whether that's true in a moment. One other confusing element of this method here is that we have six input values. Again, this seems like overkill. We have our robot neural network embedded in three-dimensional space here. The neurons have three-dimensional positions, three-dimensional three coordinates, and so do the synapses. So if we take two neurons in three-dimensional space and connect them with the synapse, if we take the midpoint of that synapse, for example, that's just three coordinates. So why are we not feeding in the x, y, and z coordinates of the midpoint of synapses? Why feed in six values rather than the three? Again, kind of seems like overkill. Um, would it be because if you just had three values, you can't change where the ends are? You can just move where the midpoint is? trying to evolve where the synapses go? We're, we're not going to evolve okay. where the synapses go. So we're going to assume for the moment that we have a fully connected uh, network. So from every sensor neuron, we have a synapse. Uh, every sensor neuron, we have a synapse going from it to every hidden. We have a synapse going from every hidden to every hidden. And another syna and synapse is going from every hidden to every motor neuron. Well, because if you have these two, they have the same center point as those two. Exactly. So it's easier to see this in two dimensions. 
So if we have two neurons in two-dimensional space, and let's say this is hidden neuron one, hidden neuron two, we have one synapse that connects hidden one to hidden two, but we also have connections going back the other way. So in the hidden layer here, we're connecting every hidden neuron to every other hidden neuron. So in this case here, the midpoints of these two synapses would have exactly the same positions. So if we fed this into a CPPN, if we only fed in the X and Y coordinates of the synapses here, what weights would be assigned to these two synapses? If the only two inputs to our CPPN were the X and Y coordinates of the synapses, what weights would be ar arriving at these two synapses? The same weights would go to both synapses. They go the same, right? Because we're feeding in the same X and Y coordinates to the same CPPN twice. So by definition, that CPPN is going to give us exactly the same number twice. There's no way for evolution to paint different weights onto these two synapses. So instead, we can do this by saying we're going to take the two coordinates here and the two coordinates here, one, two, three, four, feed that into the, height, into the CPPN to get this weight, and then feed in one, two, three, four to get a separate weight for this synapse. Okay. So we have CPPNs, which are going to be painting synaptic weights onto a neural network, and the neural network is embedded in three-dimensional space. What space is hyperneat? What, what space is the what space are the CPPNs painting into in this setup? They're painting weights onto a synapses in a neural network in three-dimensional space. But they're really painting synaptic weights into a six-dimensional space, right? We have six inputs. So from the CPPN's point of view, it's sending paint out into a six-dimensional space. Okay, so a lot of moving pieces to this experiment, but there's good reasons for including all of these pieces. Okay, that's a lot of lead up to what happened. Well, we already, sorry, we already said this here. Why would we actually want to do this? Why would we want to use CPPNs to paint weights onto neural controllers for robots? Because we're going to get these regular patterns of synaptic weights. Does that help? And what we're actually trying to do, which is evolve gates for robots. Sorry, before I show you the videos, one last, one last thing to look at here. So here's our four-legged uh, four robot. We're going to see how well the method I just described to you works compared to a control algorithm, which is called FTNEAT or fixed topology NEAT. And this is more familiar to what we've seen so far. So we're going to use the same neural network here to control the robot. So in both experiments, we're going to use this neural network. But in the control case, we're going to just use a NEAT and remember, NEAT is just evolving the topology and, syn and synaptic weights of neural networks. So we're going to apply NEAT directly to these neural networks. Remember that through crossover and mutation, the NEAT algorithm can add neurons, remove neurons. It can add synapses. It can remove synapses. We're going to remove that part of NEAT. We're going to force NEAT to just evolve synaptic weights for this neural network. We're not going to let it change the topology. That's why it's fixed topology or FT neat. Isn't that like one of the major strengths of neat that they were arguing in that, in that paper was that neat evolves the topologies as well as the weights? That's one aspect of it, right? But the other thing it does is just evolve synaptic weights. Sure. It lines up synapses based on common ancestor. And that's fine because we have fixed topology, so no problem there. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to evolve synaptic weights directly. And as we know, if we just evolve synaptic weights directly, we're going to get patterns of synaptic weights, but they're not necessarily going to be regular patterns. But in hyperneat, we probably are going to get regular patterns. Make sense? OK, so the control algorithm is more or less how we usually do things. 
hypernete is biased search towards regular patterns of synaptic weights. Uh, did they do that to, you know, just so I think I was be comparing, because the hypernete requires a fully connected hidden layer, right? Because it's painting all these weights? Not necessarily. Um, this doesn't have to be fully connected, okay. but it just happens to be a fully connected hidden layer in this case. Yeah. Okay, so if we want to know, is this painting of regular patterns of weights within a neural network, is it useful? What do we mean by useful? Useful compared to what? Well, compared to the way that we normally do things, just evolve synaptic weights. Okay. Okay, lots of lead up. Let's have a look and see how things did. What I'm going to show you here, this is the best neural network they were able to evolve with FT-neat. So the standard way of doing things, they did a whole bunch of evolutionary runs. This is the best individual from the best run. Motors are a little strong, but that's okay. How's it doing? The mystery of silly walks. It's the mystery of silly walks. Seems to be having a good time, at least. It's only using three of its legs. For the most part, that fourth one rarely touches. Still touches. Okay. Definitely Ministry of Silly Walks. Remember, that was the best they were able to evolve with the, the control algorithm. To be really fair, I'm going to show you the worst evolved gate. So they did a whole bunch of runs with hyperneat. At the end of each of the runs, they took the best individual from those runs. And I'm going to show you the worst of all the champions. Okay. And you remember, anybody remember from our lecture on legged locomotion, what gate is this? What's that? That's spotting or something like that? No. Well, it's some version of pronking. Pronking. Pronking, right? Mountain goats, as they climb up the mountain, pronking. Anybody remember Pepe Le Pew, the uh, skunk from the old Looney Tunes cartoon? Pronking. Okay. So, clearly, Hyperneat is doing better than FTNeat. I showed you the best that FTNeat could produce, and it was still a silly walk. The legs weren't very coordinated. Here, even the worst run of Hyperneat is producing regular gates. Um, if you go and Google uh, CEC 2009, was the conference and year in which this paper was published, you can go watch a whole bunch of them. Clearly, there's some more silly walks in there for you, um, but you can definitely compare more of the gates. And especially in the hyperneat runs, you see they all find regular gates. They don't all find pronking. They find other uh, four-legged gates that'll be familiar to you, but definitely doing much better. Okay. Okay. So here, a little bit more quantitatively, as usual, along the horizontal axis, we have evolutionary time. And we have fitness curves that are reporting across two sets of evolutionary runs, hyperneat and our control algorithm. What was the average fitness in the population? Where fitness is just distance from the origin, hyperneat blows FTNeat out of the, the water. So that means if we want to evolve a robot that exhibits some regular oscillatory pattern, that could be walking, that could be cycling, that could be doing something else, makes sense to bias evolutionary search towards sets of synaptic weights that have regular patterns uh, throughout them. Now, what exactly those regular patterns are would be an interesting thing to look at. Are those patterns of synaptic weights bilaterally symmetric? Is the pattern of weights on the left side of the robot's body the same as the pattern of weights on the right side of the body? like you see in the little cartoon here. Are there sinusoidal patterns? Does evolution find neural modules? Does it paint local subsets of synaptic weights with the same kind of patterns? The authors haven't looked at that yet. It'd be an interesting thing to investigate. So it's still an open question. What exactly these regular patterns are? Okay. Here's a plot of uh, just the sensor values over time. So now the horizontal axis is the lifetime of a single robot. And we're just looking at, uh, let's see here, we're looking at two different evolved gates. 
uh, two from HyperNeat and another two from FTNeat. And you can already see the silly walks down here and much more <laughs> regular patterns up top. This one is quite interesting. Um, this is a useful tool. Again, as we're going along, I'm pointing out from time to time tools that might be useful for you to analyze what your robots are doing or what evolution is doing. Uh, you remember back to our lecture on leg and locomotion, we talked about the footprint graph, which is a way to visualize how your robot is walking. This is a visualization of what evolution is doing. So we have two panels, one for our algorithm and one for our control algorithm. Each dot here corresponds to a parent and child network pair. So we have, uh, we have a CPPN, and that CPPN produces a child. And we look at the fitness of the parent and the child, and then plot the height of the point based on that fitness differential. So a point with a negative y coordinate means that the child had lower fitness than the parent, and a positive x coordinate means the child had higher fitness than the parent, and horizontal position is when during evolutionary time did that mutation uh, occur. Let's talk about hyperneat on the left here. What patterns immediately jump out to, to you about what's going on during this evolutionary run? The, uh, it's like the bulk of the solutions are, or the bulk of the children are substantially worse, but there are some that are quite a lot better than the parents. The bulk of the children are worse than their parents, which again, you would expect most random mutations tend to destroy whatever good genetic material there was in the parent. Again, an open problem, trying to ensure that doesn't happen too much. Right? A lot of them are much, much worse than their parents. Makes sense, right? You open up your laptop and change a few wires in there. Laptop's probably not going to do very well. Other patterns? Let's compare it to the control algorithm. Clearly there are differences. Hypernee tends to produce children that are more worse than their parents than the control algorithm. Why is that? <coughs> it kind of seems counterintuitive. This algorithm is supposed to be better than that algorithm. It's producing offspring that are more worse than their parents. Why do you think that might be so? Well, hypernate is changing the topology, whereas the other one is like saying, we're only going to change the weights. And like They're both only changing the weights. Remember that, so NEAT is changing the topology of the CPPNs. So the CPPNs have different topologies. But it, CPPN, regardless of its topology, is painting weights onto this fixed topology. Jeremy? Well, you're picking completely different patterns, right? You change the topology of, of your CPP, yeah, it's going to create a potentially a different pattern which could result in a radically different behavior. That's it. So um, a mutation over here, as usual, is just changing one synapse. Now that, again, that change might accumulate over the lifetime of the robot, but it's still less of a change than over here, where when you mutate a CPPN, it changes how the child CPPN paints weights onto synapses. It could change everything. So in this cartoon example here, hold on one second. So in this cartoon example here, where we're painting this insect over here, some change to one synapse in this CPPN could completely change this picture. Now, it might change it in, co in a coordinated fashion, meaning it might make the insect bigger or smaller, or it might create four segments or two segments, but it's changing some or all of the pixels. Whereas fixed topology needs or would just be changing one of these pixels, right? The change in the picture itself would be almost imperceptible. Yeah. Well, another pattern is that on the other slide is that as fitness increases with generations, you're more likely to get a bigger negative. And that seems to be a kind of pattern. Exactly. So over evolutionary time, as we go from left to right, there are more mutants 
where the children are much worse than the parents. Why do you think that's so? It's true in both pictures. Because the parents are getting better at that point, so it's easier to be worse than the parents. Exactly. You're getting, you're getting individuals in the population that are more and more optimized, right? They're at higher and higher peaks in the fitness landscape, and when you're sitting near the top of a peak, most of the steps you can take in any given direction which is a mutation, is going to be a step down, right? Yes? So the two pictures here, I think they kind of correspond to the fitness curve that you showed two slides before, where it seems like hyper-knee uh, kind of finds its optimum in the diminishing returns curve a little quicker than uh, ft knee does. True. And in addition, going back to the, the image two forward, um, it seems like though there's, there's a lot more worse parents, the, op the opposite is also true. There's a lot better. Absolutely. So you'll see this yourself when you start to do more and more evolutionary trials. If you plot the fitness curves from your evolutionary runs, they're going to have this logarithmic curve, right? It makes sense. When you're starting with random neural networks, you drop a random point in the fitness landscape, you tend to be in the valley or on the slope of a low hill. There's lots of places you can go from wherever you start to get better, right? When you're at the bottom, you can only go up. And as you start to get better and better, there are fewer and fewer mutations that will find the direction you need to step in that will take you one step higher on the nearly top of the mountain that you're, that you're at, right? So it's diminishing returns. In hypernet, I think you're right. It tends to get to increase quicker and then sort of plateau <clears throat> earlier. On the other, on the other slide there, um, do the steps maybe correspond to finding a new good best individual? Possibly. So the beneficial mutations here, the ones that increase fitness in the child, is you're asking, is, it, is that right. the, does it, it produce the new to child? Those, to those decreasing oh. steps. Yeah, I, I, not necessarily. So these are all the individuals in the population. So these okay. are not necessarily the the parents. <laughs> Plotted in this picture, not necessarily the run champions. Could be, but they just—it's all the mutations that occur in the in the population over evolutionary time. Do they know what's causing, or have a theory for what's causing those steps in the FTD? Ah, that's a good question. Any ideas? Why are there these steps in FTD? <coughs> This is something that you often see um, in, you'll, you will see this probably in your own runs, which is known as punctuated equilibrium. Equilibrium. This was a hotly contested um, phenomenon in evolutionary biology, where if you look at the fossil record, it looks like there were periods of millions of years where, where there wasn't much change. And then suddenly there was a lot of speciation, a lot of change in the diversity of life on the planet, and then a lot more punctuated equilibrium. We know why, why there were some periods of change, like the extinction event of the dinosaurs. That was an external one, hard to ignore. But there are also punctuated equilibrium, even if there are no external disturbance, disturbances to an evolving populations. So that's, that was a hotly contested uh, concept in evolutionary biology. You see it a lot in evolutionary runs. You probably see this already in your runs, right? For a while, you have a good individual, you're watching it run, 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 and then suddenly it finds a new solution, and that solution itself produces better and better solutions for three or four or 10 or 20 generations. Then it plateaus again for a while, and then you start to see these intermittent increases. That's what you're seeing occur over here. Right? Why does that happen? Well, again, if you think about fitness landscapes, it makes sense. You have populations which are climbing some local hill. They get to the top of the hill, and you're in equilibrium for a while. The population is at the top of that hill, producing mutants and crossing over genetic material. And every once in a while, one new individual will move far enough off the hill and land on the slope of a taller hill and its offspring will start to climb that taller hill, and you see a punctuated uh, event where you start to see rapid change, and then equilibrium at the higher top of the higher hill, and so on. Okay. 
So that's mutation. So hypernate itself, if you look at the average fitness differential of all <coughs> mutations, it's actually worse, right? So that kind of looks problematic. But on average, it doesn't matter if all of the individuals are much worse. We're just trying to climb upward. If a child falls into a valley next to its parent, we don't care how far the child falls. We're just looking at trying to make improvements. Not only can hypernate make improvements, but it often produces children which are much, much better than their parents. That's not just one meter up the side of a mountain, that's half a kilometer up the side of a mountain. Big jumps upward. How is that possible? Why is that possible in hypermeat and is very rare in meat? From everything we've seen about evolutionary systems so far, it seems anti-intuitive if you're standing on the slope of a mountain and you can move in a random horizontal direction that you make a big jump upward. How is that possible? Is it because the, the, fitness, the, the search base in the fitness landscape is being constrained to periodic and there's fewer, peri or there's, there's fewer patterns to, to check? So is it, is it the fact that there's just fewer patterns? Do we have sort of a simpler fitness landscape when we're looking at regular patterns? The answer is no, it's still nearly infinite, right? So it's not that we have a smaller search space. So if you're climbing Mount Fuji and you're one third of the way up Mount Fuji and you face in a certain direction and take a big step horizontally, you're making a huge mutation genetically you can make a big improvement vertically, right? Because it is a very large, regular mountain. So the fact that hypernet from time to time produces beneficial mutations that are much more fit, the children are much more fit than the parents, means we're dealing with a smoother fitness landscape than we are in neat. Not smaller, but smoother, right? Why is it smoother? Well, again, it has to do with the regular gates, right? So if you find a regular pattern like pronking, and that CPPN that produces pronking produces a child, which is mutated to some degree, that child is going to produce a different pattern. It's going to be similar to the pattern of the parent, but different. So it might be faster pronking or slower pronking, right? There you can imagine you could make big leaps, no pun intended, Big leaps forward in terms of fitness, right? But if you have silly walks and you make some change to one part of your gait cycle, you're unlikely to make big improvements in speed. So this is important because as you look around in nature, we are not random collections of cells. We are bilaterally symmetric. We have regular parts, especially in the insects. You can see repeated patterns. So biological evolution over time has found genetic encodings. Mother Nature doesn't encode using hypernet, but whatever encoding she uses tends to produce, even when there's a random mutation to biological DNA, it tends to produce an offspring which is non-random, right? It's not a random collection of cells. There are regular patterns in there. Because regular patterns in physiology, like or anatomy, tend to lead to regular patterns in behavior, which tend to be a good thing if you're trying to survive and reproduce and so on. Okay. So that's mutations. What about crossover? Uh, in hyperneat and FTNeat, we're allowing crossover. We're crossing over, um, we're crossing over these CPPNs, so we're cutting these CPPNs in half and gluing them together in the case of hyperneat. In the case of FTNeat, we're cutting these networks in half and gluing them. Uh, together. We're going to just focus for our purposes on the two orange curves. The solid curve reports whether the offspring of two parents had a fitness that was between the fitnesses of the two parents. So take the fitness of parent one, fitness of parent two, did the fitness of the child uh, uh, fall between those two fitness values. Why are they measuring that? Because that's a good measure of whether crossover worked or not. 
If I take a Mac and cut it in half and cut a PC in half and glue them together, even if it's not as good as the Mac, but slightly better than the PC, that was a successful crossover event. Very unlikely, but at least with hypernate it can, can work, right? Okay. They're then plotting the fraction of all the crossover events at that point in evolutionary time at which that occurred. And we see that over half the time in hypernate, crossover events produced children that had fitness between or close to the two parents. Crossover is working uh, in hypernate quite well, not working so much in FTME. Still sometimes, but, but much less. So, CPPNs that produce regular patterns, we can tend to cross them over pretty well. Crossing over two things that produce regular patterns and gluing them together tend to produce new regular patterns, which are similar to both parents. Okay. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to discuss these two pictures, because again, these might be useful tools for you when you start evolving your robots on your task to understand how good is evolution doing. If you plot all of the mutations being produced by your system and they're all negative values, better to go back and have a look and see how your evolutionary algorithm is, is doing. Okay, any questions about that before we move on? Okay, so um, that's neat and hyper neat, which were originally designed uh, which were originally designed to deal with the competing conventions problem, but as we just saw, they also have lots of other nice properties like biasing search towards regular patterns. We're going to switch now and deal with less intellectual issues and more practical engineering issues, which is one of the big issues in the field of crossing the reality gap. Evolve our robots in simulation for minutes or hours or weeks or months on UVM supercomputer, and you rack up a huge supercomputing bill for me, and I go to pay it, and you come back and take the best simulated robot you evolved. We find uh, someone in the mechanical engineering department to actually build one of these robots for us, and the robot does nothing. Kind of embarrassing. Okay, so how can we ensure that what we're evolving in simulation transfers to reality? Again, this is still an open problem. We're going to look at one, two, three, four different approaches to this problem. They're arranged uh, chronologically. First one we're going to look at in the moment, at the moment in the, is the noise approach. This was introduced back in the late 90s. We'll look at the Golem project that was introduced in 2000. Uh, I worked on the Resilient Machines project in 2006. We'll talk about that after spring recess. And then sort of the most recent approach, the transferability approach, which was introduced a few years ago, and at the moment is the state of the art. But we've had uh, changes in the state of the art in the late 90s, 2000, 2006, 2011, I think. So still definitely chances to do, to do better there. Okay, so let's start with the noise uh, hypothesis, lecture 15 here. Okay, let's start with some observations uh, first, which again is trying to understand the problem we're trying to solve. Problem is the reality gap. So, evolution, as it does, uh, as biological evolution does, tends to exploit whatever it's given. So, when we're evolving robots in simulation, evolution will tend to create robot controllers for us that exploit details of the physics engine. Has anybody seen any examples of that yet in your own work? If you haven't yet, you, you certainly will during the, the final project. Physics engines, as we talked about when we talked about physics engines, are not perfect models of reality. And there's a lot of inaccuracies in physics engines that given the opportunity, evolution will exploit. So we have, if we have controllers that are increasingly adapting to the idiosyncrasies of a simulation, the probability that as evolution proceeds, we're going to be able to transfer to reality goes down over time. Evolution is specializing to uh, our virtual uh, reality. Okay, so the hypothesis here is kind of a simple one, which is don't let evolution exploit aspects of the simulator too much by adding noise to aspects of the, the simulator, right? So that's a good approach, it makes sense. So if aspects of the simulator are always changing, then evolution might not try and exploit them because there's nothing static, there's nothing constant there to lock onto. Right? 
One of the things that's um, most tricky in a physics engine is collision models. Remember when we talked about two three-dimensional objects coming into contact with one another? Physics engines tend to approximate that. So there's lots of opportunities there for evolution to, uh, to exploit how things collide with one another. I should find a video at some point, but I, I did an experiment several years ago with the robot arm that was trying to pick up an object. Remember the active categorical perception robot arm? I had one robot where it reached down, touched the object with its palm, and lifted it up, although I hadn't put Velcro into the simulation. It had figured out that there was some certain velocity and some sort of incoming angle where the rectangular solid of the palm collided with the sphere of the object, and the points somehow got all mixed up together, and it was able to lift the object without actually grasping it. Happens all the time in physics engines. So we could noisify the way in which the physics engine detects collisions and resolves them. Um, as the simulation becomes more complex, we need to noisify more and more things, right? So friction, mass distribution. So at the moment, every object you create in a physics engine has a uniform mass distribution. The density at any point within the object is the same. That is definitely not true of any real world uh, object. <clears throat> Uh, the geometry itself, joint properties, sensor properties, motor properties, you name it, right? This growing laundry list of all these things that we need to uh, noisify. So in this experiment, they said, well, let's go the other way. Let's try and make as simple a simulation as possible. Let's make a minimal simulation. So there are less targets for evolution to try and exploit. Okay, so we're going to create this minimal simulation in which there is as little detail as possible. Um, actually, here was just, I put this in as a screenshot from uh, one, of, one of my own experiments where you can see the reality gap in action. So the simulate, simulated gate shown in the top panels here, we transferred that controller to the physical robot. It actually worked most of the time in the actual gate. But there are periods in which where the physical robot would rock forward over its left and right legs, the uh, simulated robot would not rock forward. Now, it turns out that, that didn't matter too much. It would recover and keep moving. So there are particular points in the gait cycle of this one walking robot in which there were differences between simulation and reality. The physical robot rocked forward um, and the simulator didn't because we went back and looked at this. There was a tiny little bit more mass in the front of the robot than there was in the simulated robots. The mass distribution was slightly different. It was very, very slight, but it was enough to cause this hiccup in the crossing of the reality gap. Okay. Big challenge in the field. Okay. So what are we going to do then? We're going to take this minimal simulation and we're going, to do, we're going to look at all the aspects of the simulator and we're going to take all of those features and break them into a base set and an implementation set. So the base set are all of those things that have some relationship from the simulator to reality. So for example, the floor. The robot is walking over a floor. The floor itself is in the base set. That's, that's pretty important. Um, the implementation set are things that don't have a basis in reality. There's something that's in the simulator that's there to try and approximate something in reality, but they don't actually exist in reality. To give you an example of an implementation set feature, or an implementation feature, in the physics engine you're using, when two objects collide, the physics engine uh, spits out this cloud of points. And these points exist at the intersection of these two objects. Those points themselves don't exist in reality when two objects actually collide. They're, some, they're a fiction. They're made up by the physics engine creators to approximate something in reality. So those points themselves would be something that we would definitely put a lot of noise on uh, in, in reality. So, the things that are in the base set, we're going to noisify a little bit. We want evolution to rely on them, rely on the floor, use friction in the floor, because that's important. But the things that are in the implementation set, 100% of noise. So for example, when, we, when the physics engine generates these points, they're going to be at completely different positions from one time step to the next. We're going to try and noisify them as much as possible. We're still going to keep them, because we need them. 
But we're going to try and make sure that evolution, we're going to poison the milk for evolution here. Don't ever rely on this, this aspect. OK. OK, so I mentioned this is an experiment from way back at the beginning of the field. So not surprisingly, our good friend, the Kepler robot, shows up again. Just as a reminder, we've got the left and right wheel. We have, uh, let's see, eight. Uh, infrared sensors, they send out an infrared pulse and they measure the amount of time that it takes for the in infrared pulse to come back. Longer return signals means that there is an object far away from the robot. A shorter time delay means there's an object closer, closer in. We're going to have two ambient uh, lights, that should say ambient light sensors. So there's going to be a light source in this environment, light, uh, amount of light on the left, amount of light on the right. So we've got 10 sensors, two motors. Okay, what's the task? This is a very famous uh, test setup from psychology. Usually this is a rat running through the T maze, but in this case we're going to have a Kepera running through the T maze. Um, the Kepera is going to start at the base of the stem of the T. It's going to move up the stem of the T, and there is going to be a light source that appears either on its right, as in the picture here, or sometimes on the left, and then the light shuts off. The rat or the Kepera continues on its merry way, and when it gets to the junction, it has to turn in the direction in which it saw the light. Not a very complex task. Um, this is a canonical test for testing whether an organism, or in our case, a robot, has the ability to remember, right? The light source is no longer there, so you have to remember which side the light was shone on and turn in that direction. Okay. Pretty straightforward, so let's make a fitness function here. Um, we're going to start with D1 and D2. So how much distance did the, the robot travel up the stem of the T, D1? How much did it travel along the top of the T, D2, regardless of which direction it turned in? And if it happens to turn in the right direction, we give it an additional 100 points. So we're selecting for robots that move. They move in the stem and in the top of the T, so they're able to move, then turn, and move again. And then also, the third term there, we're also giving an extra reward for turning in the right direction. Okay, that's the task. This is the minimal simulation down here, which looks kind of strange. We've got two infinitely long corridors where in phase one, the robot is gonna move, and then there's a light source. It sees the light on the right or the left and then it just keeps moving, and we give some fixed time period, so it can't move forever. We're gonna see how long it does in just this corridor. Then we're gonna take this robot out, drop it here, where there's a noise zone behind it, and it's going to either turn to the left or turn to the right and move D2 amount. They're not even simulating the T itself. They've broken the T into these two pieces, and they're going to test the robot in these two conditions separately. Before I tell you why, any guesses about why they would do that? So the noise zone down here means that any sensor values that are coming from behind the robot, and remember it has two infrared sensors that look from behind, or when it turns, any infrared sensor values that hit that noise zone get back a completely random value. What does that mean? Why would they do that? Well, it's kind of blinding the robot behind itself. It's, bl so. it's blinding the robot here. If the robot ever looks here, and if it's behind itself, yes, it blinds the back sensors. If it turns, any sensor value that looks into the noise zone is blinded. It gets back some random value. It's completely random, which means it's part of the implementation set. Idea? Do they not want it to turn around by the way it came? Maybe. I mean, if the robot turned around and came back the way it came, then it would get 0 D2. It never moved in the top of the T. So that robot would get penalized anyways. It's not so much about. Uh, penalizing it for turning and going back. It's a good idea. Think about the task at the top. We have this robot that has these eight infrared sensors. It's moving up the stem, and then it gets to the junction and has to turn, and they're sort of simulating the junction here, and they're noisifying this part of the junction. 
Any engineers here? Anybody know about real infrared sensors? Okay. Okay. All right. It's, that gap is about to be filled. Not to worry. We'll come back to it in a moment. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about this minimal simulation. It is really minimal. There is not only no physics engine, there's no physics at all, really, except for high school, uh, high school math here again. The, the entire simulation is two lookup tables. Okay, what is the lookup table? Well, in this, the first lookup table, they have a whole bunch of values for the robot's orientation and commands going to the motor. So remember, there are two wheels, so there are two motor commands. So in that lookup table, we say, what are the two values of the motor neurons? What is the current orientation of the robot? And we update the new value of the robot given the commands to the motors and its current position and orientation. So it's updating the position and orientation of the robot just based on, on that information. So there's no momentum, there's no F equals MA, it's just which direction is the robot heading in, the wheels are trying to spin at this speed, so the new position of the robot should be this and the new orientation should be this. They create a big lookup table with sets, pairs of motor output values and orientation and elements in that lookup table give the uh, code back, the new position and new orientation. Is it so that when there's a gap in the wall, the robot basically ignores the gap? Is that what they're trying to do? When there's a gap in the wall or when it's in the junction, by putting noise here, you're getting evolution to try and ignore it. Yes, that's right. And why that's the case, again, we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, so that's lookup table number one. Lookup table number two is for the sensor. So we have the robot at a, a given orientation and a position, and given the fact that it's in one of these two corridors, it's going to be, the, the sensor itself is going to be facing one or the other wall, unless it's facing directly up or down uh, the corridor. So table two says, given an orientation of the robot, and distance from whatever wall it's pointing at, it's gonna give back the length of the line segment for that infrared sensor. So in essence, the lookup table is gonna supply the eight infrared values. So we have eight input neurons and they're getting their eight values from the second lookup table. Propagate those eight values down to the two output values. Take those two output values plug them into the first table, and it moves the robot. That's the simulator, two lookup tables. Can't get much more minimal than that, right? Okay. Okay, so what is the base set and what is uh, the implementation set here? So base set, these are things that have some basis in reality. How the robot moves in response to motor signals. So generally speaking, if the right wheel spins faster than the left wheel, it turns to the left. Remember, we're gonna put a little bit of noise on the base set, so the amount it moves to the left is gonna be noisified a little bit, but it still moves to the left, right? That's important. The evolution has to learn how to control the robot. How the infrared sensors respond, that's also important. So table two here, which is how the sensors respond, when they get the value back from the lookup table, they add 10% noise to that. So the light sensors are a little bit noisy as well. Same thing for the ambient uh, sensors. So when the light shines in the light zone, the amount of light falling on the two sensors, that's also noisified a little bit. Right? Evolution needs those signals to figure out how to traverse the maze properly and get a high fitness value. So we need to have those details in there. The implementation set is how the infrared sensors behave when the robot is in the junction. So we're going to add 100% noise to any infrared sensor that sends out a signal and penetrates the noise zone. By adding 100% noise, we get, we're gonna try and teach evolution to ignore any signals coming back from the noise zone. How can evolution do that? Well, how can evolution do that? I'll put that out to all of you. Whatever the robot does, it should more or less try and ignore any signals that go into this, into the intersection here, into the junction. 
So if you think about it, an infrared sensor is sending out a light pulse and is calculating the amount of time that comes back. That's very tricky when that signal is going out into a complex environment, not that complex, but complex enough, like the junction. You might get a little bit of reflectance, signals bouncing around. It's tricky to simulate how infrared sensors work in an environment like that compared to just facing a wall. So evolution isn't going to be able to avoid the situation altogether. It's got to get into the junction and turn in the right direction. Think about any given controller. It's going to approach the junction, and as it's approaching and moving around, there are going to be particular signals that are arriving at the sensor layer. And that's going to be a signature that it's approaching the junction. It might not be there yet, but it's getting close. And that's, that combination of signals, if evolution tunes the, synaptics, the synaptic weights correctly, is going to start to ignore that pattern and might ignore it altogether. So in essence, the robot is kind of shutting its eyes. The, se the sensor values are still coming in, but remember they're being combined in the, in the neural network layer. So that particular combination of values might have less and less impact on the motors itself. The motors are also being influenced by, I'm going to just skip ahead, the motors are also being influenced by recurrent connections. Remember that recurrent connections give memory. So in essence, the robot is going to try and close its eyes when it detects that it's getting close to the junction and remember what to do. It's going to send the same pair of values to the motor neurons for 10 time steps. And then, given some information in its brain, it's going to turn either left or right. So it can't force, it can't literally close its eyes, it can't shut off its sensors, but it can tune the weights so that the neural network kind of discards values that indicate you're in the noise zone. Signals are starting to become more and more noisy. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so that's our, that's our uh, junction. There are other implementation details. Um, they didn't describe this very well in the paper. They didn't add 100% of noise here. They just put more noise. These investigators love to just sprinkle noise on everything. So the side from which the light comes from, that makes sense, right? Because if you don't randomize the light, the light's always coming from the right, making things pretty easy on the robot. It doesn't need to remember the light. It always just turns to the right. So we've got to switch which side the light comes from. They're going to change the corridor width a little bit as well. Starting robot orientation, so when it starts at the bottom of the stem of the T in phase one, what is its angle uh, pointing up the stem of the T? <coughs> what is the length of the light zone? So this area here, or sorry, this area here in which the light's coming from, how wide or how narrow is that aperture that the light is shining through, and also the corridor length itself, they're changing that. So they're changing, they're putting a bit of noise on everything to make sure evolution isn't exploiting anything too much. Okay. Here's the neural network again. Um, we see some recurrent connections in there. They're also, as we've seen before, they're hardwiring whether the synapses are excitatory or inhibitory. But within those bounds, evolution is able to tune the strength of excitation or the strength of inhibition. And they're also evolving uh, the activation threshold. So we're back to a threshold activation function. If the raw sum arriving at this neuron is greater than 0.71, this neuron fires, the raw sum is below that value, the neuron sends out a value of zero. Okay, pretty much what we've seen before. Where's the memory of the light here? Trick question as always, right? There isn't a light memory neuron here somewhere. You can see that there are recurrent connections here connecting up the ambient light sensor neurons. So they're right where the light is coming in. So the investigators are trying, giving evolution a strong hint. You should remember information that's coming in from the ambient light sensors. That's important. <coughs> Okay, and uh, some super high-tech uh, 
figures here back from the late 90s. Uh, they placed a little uh, light bulb on top of the robot, darkened the room, and then took a time-lapse uh, image of what was going on. How did the robot do <coughs> at crossing the reality gap? We evolved controllers using these two lookup tables and then transferred it into a physical Kepler robot. How does it do? Not bad, huh? This was pretty exciting at the time. Again, very simple robot, very simple task, but a proof of concept that you could evolve controllers for robots and simulation, transfer them to reality. So top pair of figures, the robot clearly remembers the light and is able to remember which side it saw the light on. It, this single controller is robust, so if they did it multiple times in the same environment, it still worked, so they didn't just get lucky once. They widened the stem of the T in the middle pair of images, still does well, and then they widened it again in the bottom pair of images. And you see something interesting happening. You get these two bands here. Where do you think these two bands are coming from? Following the walls. Following the walls a little bit. They're placing the, the robot down here at the base of the stem, and they're orienting the robot at different initial orientations. They're also seeing how robust it is to this. And if you face the robot towards the left, not surprisingly, it goes to the left a little bit and then straightens out. Same with the, the right side. Awesome. Okay, first proof that you can cross the reality gap. And along the way, we also have a robot that remembers which side of, that the light is on. Right? This robot has memory? Are you sure? Thinking about thinking is misleading. Does this task really require memory? And you can tell from the fact that I'm asking this that it doesn't. How can you solve, if you're an embodied agent, how could you solve this task if you had no memory? Seems impossible. This is a good example of where Cartesian dualism comes back to haunt us. So we're so used to thinking about of being neural chauvinists, right? Oh, we store the information in our brain and off we go, right? We don't need the body for this task. Maybe as soon as it, as soon as it detects light, you start it moving in that direction. Exactly. Like, you know, right. you, it might just like drag along the wall until it gets to the corner and then goes. There you go. All right, someone escaping from Cartesian... Uh, Car uh, the Cartesian trap, right? So if you think carefully about it, you can exploit your body and your interaction with the environment in this task, so you don't need to remember. The moment you see the light on the left, turn to the left and keep going. Even if you now have forgotten which side of the light you're on, when you get close to the junction and your eyes are starting to close because you're going to ignore the junction, you say, okay, I'm close to this side, so I'm going to turn in 10 time steps. Or when you see the light on the right, Follow the right wall, and then as your eyes start to close, say, okay, in 10 time steps, I'm going to make a right turn because right now the right wall is closer to me than the left wall. Okay, if you're ever trying to explain this idea of thinking about thinking is misleading to a friend, tell them about the team A's and see if they can figure out how to solve this task without memory. Okay, so a pretty simple experiment. Um, back in the late 90s to try and solve the reality gap problem. We've got eight minutes left, so we'll start in on lecture 16. Um, this is the Golem project. Anybody remember who or what the Golem was? No? This clay monster from um, the Hebrew tradition was this myth of this inanimate piece of clay, and when you put the Word of God embedded it in the clay forehead of uh, this monster would come to life and now it would be alive. Makes sense. Good, good title for an uh, evolutionary robotics experiment. Okay. The Golem Project was inspired by an earlier idea. First of all, going back to the 80s, which is NASA started to realize it would be very expensive to build expensive robots and send them to uh, another planet to explore. Better to send a robot that would build a copy of itself when it got there using local materials, and that copy would build a copy and <coughs> self-replicating machines. That idea is based on an even earlier idea by John von Neumann. All the computer scientists here should know von Neumann architectures, which is the basic computer architecture that all our computers is based. 
Von Neumann was famous for lots of things. One of them was also von Neumann machines, which again was this idea of how do you build a machine that would make a copy of itself. So we're starting the discussion of the Golem project with self-replication, which is kind of one doesn't have too much to do with the reality gap problem, at least on the surface. How are these two ideas connected? The, the Golem project was reported uh, in Nature Magazine back in 2000 and got a lot of media attention at the time. And according to the media, this was a scientific report in which the scientists had made robots that make its own robots. So I haven't described the experiment to you yet, but if you look at the title of this paper, Automatic Design and Manufacture of Artificial Life Forms, why was this paper so exciting at the time? People weren't really interested in the reality gap problem. How is it possible that this particular news article made it to the cover of the New York Times back in 2000? Uh, because um, there could possibly be robots that were produced. Yes, which imagine you can imagine captures the public imagination. So this is an idea that had been around for a long time, but it was still an idea. And this paper, aside from describing crossing the reality gap, also introduced or suggested this idea of replication through manufacture. Look carefully at the physical robot here. Aside from evolutionary robotics and physics engine, what do you think the other technology was that was in play in this experiment? Batteries. Batteries. Batteries were not that exciting back in 2000. There was another very exciting technology, or mysterious technology, that got its debut in this paper. So you can see we're not dealing with Keperas anymore, right? There's a physically constructed robot here. How do you think this robot was made? 3D printing. 3D printing, that's it. So the basic idea of the Golem project was, and I can say this because I know the authors, a lazy approach to solving the reality gap problem. Who cares if 90 of the robots we print or 99 of the robots we evolve in simulation don't transfer to reality? The 100th one will. So instead of trying to solve the reality gap problem, let's solve the manufacturing problem. Evolution can produce as many evolved robots as we want, and we will just keep 3D printing them until one of them crosses the reality gap. We don't have to noisify the simulation. We don't have to do all these other fancy things. Let's just keep spitting them out. So this paper, aside from being interesting, interesting from a robotics point of view, captured the public imagination because this was the first exposure of the public to this idea of 3D printers. 3D printers had been around for a long time and used in industry for prototyping, but it was still something that was restricted to the lab. Here it was being used not just to print things, but to print robots, an amazing idea uh, at the time. Okay, so how did this work? Well, step one is gonna look extremely familiar to you. We're gonna evolve a robot to locomote in simulation. We're going to evolve uh, these strange kind of robots that are made up of balls and uh, bars connecting, connecting pairs of balls together. What, uh, so we're going to evolve the body and brain of these robots together. So again, this is an experiment now. We're not just evolving synaptic weights. We're not just evolving the architecture of neural network controllers. We're also evolving the body. We're going to put all three things, synaptic weights, neural network <laughs> structure, and physiological structure or anatomy under evolutionary control, evolve in simulation, manufacture the robot using a 3D printer. And back in 2000, the only thing we could really do with 3D printers was print plastic. So all of the white plastic that you see in the picture here was 3D printed. And then as a third step, which is where humans still had to come in, we're gonna snap in all the metal components to the robot. Okay. So let's have a look at the genotype first, and maybe we'll finish with that today. Um, the genotype starts as a list of embedded lists. So there's going to be a list of lists encoding. Remember that the genotype is the blueprint. There's different ways we might encode um, a robot. We can encode it as a matrix of synaptic weights. Here it's going to be a list of lists. It's going to be a list of four lists. The first list is all the vertices. 
then which are uh, the spheres in making up the robot, bars which connect the spheres together, neurons as we've seen before, and the synapses are going to be implicitly defined. We'll see how that's done in a moment. And then the actuators themselves. If you look down here at the cartoon, you'll see the spheres and the bars connecting them uh, together. We have sort of this free-floating neural network. It's not embedded at any one position in the morphology. We have a whole bunch of neurons, and we're going to assume a fully connected neural network. Uh, every neuron is connected to every other neuron. Some of the neurons have a synapse that goes from the neuron to a bar, and a bar that receives an incoming synapse suddenly becomes an actuated bar or a piston. So that bar is turned into two bars, which can extend or compress the length of the bar that's being innovated by that synapse. So that's how the brain is going to control the robot's body. I think we'll leave it there for today. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight. Good luck finishing off your week. Have a good spring recess, and we'll see you the following Tuesday.